Katie Cornfield, your host today for Half Hour with Late Night with Seth Myers. Joining us are writer and host Seth Myers and producer Mike Shoemaker. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for making the time to be here with us today. We're thrilled to be with you. Oh, wonderful. I want to start off by asking each of you what inspired you to want to work in the entertainment business? Oh, Shoemaker's answer is so much better than mine. It's just, just older, say, it's just based in the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, mine is very easy that I grew up watching shows like SNL mm -hmm. and desperately wanted to be on shows like SNL. And when I showed up, my Shoemaker was one of the first people I met there, but his path was far more interesting. Um, I, uh, I didn't know when I was young, a long time ago, that you could have a job in television. So uh, I, because I didn't see, you know, you saw people on TV like, comedians yeah i don't identify with that i uh, look at the camera i wanted to be <laughs> hi <laughs> obviously i'm not a good performer uh i uh, wanted to be a producer so uh or i i didn't even know that existed but the closest thing i think i ever saw was like the mirror tile Moore show which had like a local news and it looked like you could you know it looked sparsely uh populated it looked like oh i could probably get into something like that so i started in local news for that reason and I think one of the best differences about our path to the exact same place and this partnership that is going on 20 years. Yeah, yeah, I think we're about to hit our anniversary. I was the kind of guy who was in my college improv troupe and Shoemaker was the kind of guy who drove a forklift in a warehouse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a also a perfectly valid path, I would say. I imagine it's still a hustle every day because we all know that working in this business is hard work. But was there a moment where you sort of breathed a sigh of relief and thought, okay, I can do this. Like I can actually make a living <laughs> I love. I mean, there were a lot of, you know, uh, the relief is very temporary. I think you're accurate yeah. saying that. But I, I think that when I got to do Weekend Update at SNL, which I think was around year five or six, that was the first time where I felt my feet sort of firmly on the ground and thought, oh, this might be a longer career than I had ever hoped. I, uh, when I turned 60 two years ago, that's when I realized like, oh, I don't need a plan B. <laughs> I finally got to this age. Yeah. And, but literally, like I would say to people, oh, something happened. I don't need to like go to Banana Republic and look and say like, I wonder where the break rooms are because that's where I would work. <laughs> you let your um, forklift license lapse. I did. I finally, I didn't <laughs> renew it. Up until then, it was very renewed. So uh, yeah, I, I, I only recently, realize that oh if this all goes to hell i could uh retire which is people what people my age say when they can't get work and then i have to say once he came to this realization he walks around with a lot more ease I than don't the rest show of us up if i don't want to <laughs> if this goes all to hell i'm the one who's gonna be yeah. in the republic holding the slack yep you don't know how to hold slack. no i'll learn <laughs> Now, we're going to get into our conversation about late night, but before we do, we have a quick clip we'd like to play to familiarize viewers with the show. It's time for a closer look. This is a nightmare. Republican Adam Kinzinger said the party is basically the Titanic, but when the Titanic went down, people tried to get off it. I think you got it now. Yeah. Based All off right. that, I think what, you have a full what, comprehension. What more do you need show. to know? <laughs> Let's discuss the dynamic and process of creating a late night talk show on a daily basis. Describe a typical day. We should base it on a closer look day, which is we do closer looks three days out of four. So yeah. those, those days we come in, first we have to chat for a while. Yeah, That's about a, non show stuff. No, 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 it's about <laughs> life like complaining about life yeah. or, or not, or yeah. actually half the time celebrating yeah. it. <laughs> We're, we're very we we're uh one of the things that makes us a good partnership is we're very uh aware of how lucky we are we're like walking gratitude journals but we get a first draft of a closer look from our uh closer look head writer sal gentile and that takes up 15 minutes of our show so that's where that's most of most, our day is spent yeah. and it's adding jokes it's um cutting things adding things as news breaks throughout the day although that's happening less now um yeah I can't, why is it happening less now i feel like crazier things used to happen more often the crazy things happen like also uh, mm. and i think th right, that we'll he planned it so that things happen like every hour so that he was 
you know, always breaking news. Uh, that like like they still say breaking news, but I it's it's it, less breaking. It's yeah. nothing breaking. Um, so uh, that first draft comes in, and then we anxiously await. You know, you, Seth starts working on it. Seth does a lot of writing in the day, uh, so Seth starts uh, pounding on that, and then uh, our head writer Alex Bays sends in a pass that has seven like a plus jokes. a plus jokes. Yeah, that uh, that are, and then yeah, you, you kind of go through his pass and look you know, scan to blue, because that's where they are. And we and just like, sort of marry it. And then make Seth puts draft. it all together into one thing. And then we read that. And the other thing Alex Bay is doing at the same time is taking and compiling our monologue jokes from our seven monologue writers who were basically writing about 30 to 50 jokes right, each. Right, right. Seven remote. Everyone, uh, Bayes is, is on location. Everyone else is remote, except for like Amber, who, people who perform like Amber and Jeff Wright. Everyone else is remote. Yeah. Uh, Including Sal, who we have not seen in, uh, uh, yeah. you know, he had a baby right before the pandemic, so I, it could be like two Christmases ago. Before <laughs> Sal, and then so that's sort of the first act of our show is monologue and a closer look, which is also obviously the longest act of our show, and then we also have really talented segment producers and researchers who are putting together packs of the guests for the day. But I will say one of the most delightful things about doing this show for myself personally is not overthinking or over preparing for the interviews. The longer I've done this, the more I've realized the fun comes out of just listening and being in the moment. And so once we get past the sort of written act of our show, it kind of stops yes. being work in a really nice way and starts just being this incredible job where you get to talk to people you like and respect. It's shocking to me how little, not that you don't prepare, but uh, for the interviews, but how uh, quickly you do it. Like we used to have back when people came in the office, we would have a, a meeting with the second producers and they would, you know, kind of say, these are the suggestions and Seth would speed read and okay, fine. And then I would think like, oh, I guess he must look at it when I'm not paying attention. And then the interview would come and, and, and he either hit on those or had an area. And, uh, and sometimes I would say like, oh, well, uh, what time do you go over it again? I'm like, I don't. Jesus, you just take that in. But it's supposed to be because he's prepping to have an actual conversation and not to have like a prompted conversation, which is, uh, I think, pretty rare, uh, pretty phenomenal. Actually. It's certainly more fun to do. That yeah, way. yeah. And so, so I don't know what's coming, which is the only fun of our show is when I don't know what's coming. Yeah, when you know what's coming, it's a drag. Yeah. Then it's. Uh, just... Speaking of interviews, who is your dream interview that you well, have on the show? Look, here's the thing. For a really long time, the answer to that question was Rihanna. And then we got Rihanna. Right. And I don't want to be one of those guys who has my dream come true and just moves on to a second dream. <laughs> I'm not going to be one of those actors who pretends I always wanted a second Oscar. I got what I wanted. I would like whoever is handing out dreams to move on to the next person and please give it to them because I am perfectly satisfied. Um, my, my, yeah. I have uh, dream guests. Uh, Amy Poehler. Um, uh, Andy Samberg and John Mulaney, which like they're not hard gets. <laughs> right. That's the dream to me is to, to watch you guys talking. There are people out there who are, you know, more famous or, or uh, you know, more unexamined. Don't let Samberg hear you. Said no, more nobody famous more famous people. than Samberg. <laughs> uh, but they, but uh, those conversations, that's what I come to work for. Those are. That's officially not work at all. Yes, that's just fun. And it's also so much like what it's like to be with Seth and those people. It's 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 an accurate representation. There's just a, a camera added. So those are my dream guests and will always be my dream guests. Although I welcome someone to beat it. Who was your most challenging interview? I, I won't name names, but I will say politicians on both sides of the aisle have a tendency to give very long answers not to the question you asked, but to the question they wish you had asked. And I, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And so you have it puts you in a weird position as well, because I think that when we take the idea of what it means to be a host seriously and, and trying to make people right. comfortable and being polite, whether you agree or disagree. And so cutting people off is something I try not to do. And I think sometimes that is a detriment to the show when you have someone who is kind of reverting back to a stump speech. Now, one of the things I've always admired about, I'd, I've admired about you and the show is your commitment to not only a, a diverse group of guests, 
but also how much you champion the brilliant women who are on your writing staff. How do you think that you've evolved as a host and how do you think the show's evolved over the past year? Well, I mean, I think everyone who went through this pandemic had to evolve the way they did their jobs, no matter if they were in show business or elsewhere. For us, it was thrilling to figure it out. I know it's weird to say first, that. At first, terrifying. Yes. At first, terrifying. <laughs> Start, like terrifying was the, like, day one was terrifying. The most terrifying thing was the day we switched to an HD camera and saw how bad I looked with the makeup <laughs> I was doing by myself. Yeah. And then we realized, oh, we have to go back to the iPad. <laughs> you were like, oh, I think it should be sharper. <laughs> we're like, oh, all right, we'll see. Um, but we also had to do everything earlier. You know, that was what was really impressive as far as how our writing staff adapted is, you know, everybody was at home. So it wasn't just me filming at home with a, you know, slow internet. I then had to upload things to an editor who was also in their apartment who then had to upload it. Who had to, you know, we used to do it backwards. The closer look would be written and they would prepare all the graphics to be over Seth's shoulder. And then this time Seth had to do the words and, and then everything was added later and that and they had to send it over the same slow internet that we're all on and uh because no one was anywhere near the building that was that was uh six months of kind of terror kind of terror yeah the part of it that was the most gratifying is that i've never felt closer to the at-home audience because by removing that studio sort of proxy audience I do feel as though I'm talking directly to the people who are watching it at home. And especially when I was also doing the show from home, like other than the fact that it was going over network airwaves, if I ultimately felt like I was talking to individuals because there was literally no one else I could be talking to. And that has, even though we're back in the studio, that has continued is that I feel, and I always, I would have told you I felt close to the audience, but I, I feel really close to the audience now in a way that's uh, been really rewarding. And speaking of feeling connected and closer to your audience, you know, I imagine that many of your viewers feel like they know you. They welcome you into their living rooms every night to be entertained, and they probably feel as if you're their friend or their neighbor, you know, you're the guy down the street. So do people run up to you? I think that when you have a job in show business where your job is to be yourself, and in fact, the longer you do the show, the more yourself I think you become. Right. Like, I think this show is truer to my personality now. Oh, yeah. This is, they don't come up to you on the street because there's no street anymore. Yeah. Or, or not yet. I think it's starting. Uh, they approach, uh, we do a thing called corrections every Thursday. Right. Where Seth, uh, uh, for your consideration, by the way, it's in like a little odd category. <laughs> That's what we're doing. For uh, uh, what is it? Most navel gazing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, self indulgence uh, uh, on the internet, uh, and uh, and where Seth speaks directly, you know, to the audience and answers questions from people and talk about familiar. It's really fun. It, it's because everyone uh, writes in the YouTube comments, which you know everyone advises you don't read. Seth ignored it and read it, and so he like. Everyone feels they can engage with them to a level, and it worked. Like they act like like you read those things and then reply. And so I, I and encourage everyone to watch it because it's a it's a social experiment, kind of gone awry. But no, it's working because it's working. I think the really nice thing is they everybody who's engaging with it sort of understands the game. They're a little more to, respectful than regular ones. They're respectful, but the game is they have to be nitpicky, and then I have to respond to it in a way that's exasperating. And they, it's been so fun. And again, doing it's we never explained the rules of what we were going right. to do. But the reason we kept doing it, we didn't think it'd be a thing we kept doing, except now it's our favorite thing of the week. And it does speak to the fact that, you know, I, I all jokes aside, like I can read our YouTube comments and, and walk away feeling better about our show than worse. And I think that's pretty unique. Um, this one I feel bad about. I said, shaman when it's shaman and what makes it worse is my staff has tried to correct me on this in the past and i continue to get it wrong so shaman me <laughs> the 
That was a joke somebody made in corrections. And, but because I'm a dad, I'm legally allowed to steal that joke. <laughs> I talked about our uh, photographer Lloyd, who's Scottish. And you know, I, I talked like him. I used his voice. And someone said that Scottish accent is an abomination, <laughs> which is what we tell him every day. <laughs> Like, we know. Because I've heard, I've heard regular Scottish people, and Lloyd ain't that. You know, say, Lloyd, can you get some, you know, pictures of the guests? I don't have my camera. Nobody told me. We're like, why do we? And it's an interactive piece. No, I love it. I love it it weekly and I'm always curious to see if Seth will make the time limit which I know is a big thing for you. Well, so. This is all manufactured. His his interpretation of me. I mean, are you surprised? Are you surprised now at how Mikey the Shoe actually sounds? Yes. Is this why? Because I, I hear you. I hear you it laughing is, in the background and it I is character it. assassination 100%. Uh, <laughs> Perfectly happy with it. I don't care. Uh, my only, other, I don't like being on camera, as you can tell by the way I'm uh, shaking and jittering. Uh, so uh, the camera's not allowed to cut to me, no matter how many times Seth references yeah. me, which is what the crew has learned. They're not allowed to put on the light, like none of that. So I feel like I have become. I think that I am Hobbs to your Calvin. I think that the mm -hmm. things that you feel, like it should end in ten minutes, or all of the, the the conscience that you want to invent, you you superimpose on me. Yeah. Great. I mean, I am probably this your is conscience. crazy that you're saying. I definitely once said, how was it today? And you said, it's a little long. So don't act like you didn't want to well, say. A little. I mean, that's, I'm not a liar. <laughs> There's a little in there. But I don't. Uh, 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 you don't give me a time. Limit. And I don't scream uh, like, uh, um, uh, I guess I mean, I, you maybe don't scream when, judge you're doing, it. when you're doing judge, you know, video judge my Judge my uh, never, Bronx accent. Yeah. <laughs> I, tried to, I tried to lose it for these panels. Well, I think, you know, at times going down that rabbit hole and, and taking those comments from the YouTube uh, viewers, it's what makes the show innovative. I know like one of my favorite interviews, recent interviews, was the one you did with you and McGregor with the Gillum and the bird, um, because I thought, you know what, that's exactly something Seth would do. He would go down the rabbit hole trying to find a YouTube video to show his son, and then once you know, Ewan is the voiceover, and the whole thing was, I mean, it was hysterical, and then you find a way to, you know, put it in your show. But let's just show what I'm watching <laughs> with my, at the time, four-year-old son. Okay. A razor bill makes a final attack. Oh. Unable to steer, it's heading straight for the rocks. I okay. mean, that's okay, no, 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 worse. No, but listen, listen, but listen, what happens thereafter is there's a shot of it coming out of the water and climbing back up on the rock, right? Yeah. But well, I'm a filmmaker. I slammed the laptop shut. <laughs> I, so I'm I didn't see that part. There is a shot that they cut to before they see it coming back out. Now I know that might be because it's not the same bird coming out of the water as when we just saw smashing off the rock, right? So I said to the director, I said, you got to promise me that's the same bird because I don't think that's the same bird. And he assures me that this is what happens in nature. They fall off. They you know so how they get down into the water because the parents try and lure them down. They're down there coming. Come on, son, jump. And the birds are like quite rightly going that. I'm not doing that. Well, the nice thing about that is you realize Anyone who comes on a talk show, most people, as a guest, like it's also burdensome to be a talk show guest. And I think we often forget that, you know, people have to show up, they have to be interesting. You know, I do it every day. And, you know, so I naturally, I think, or at least I hope get better at it. Uman shows up and has to do it. And we say, hey, do you want to talk about this, you know, voiceover you did seven years ago? I mean, he's thrilled because, you know, especially when you're on a press tour for Halston, like that was the only time right. you got to talk about whether a, a, a small bird died or not. <laughs> and if it was the same bird, come on. If that was he, the same he bird. did say that BBC swore to him the bird lived. A couple more questions. So if you could have dinner with anyone living or dead, who would it be? Mm -hmm. 
I think um, the uh, the original Hamilton and Burr, and then I just play them the Hamilton soundtrack. Like oh. that would be the dinner. I'd just right. play the whole thing. I'd be like, just listen, don't say anything. Yeah. Then I'd show them photos of the cast. Yeah. And then I'd say, just have talk yeah. about talk <laughs> about what you think. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> um, uh, Amy Poehler, <laughs> Andy Samberg, John Mulaney. And they're great. You know what I would do? Those three and their great great grandfathers, just to get, yeah, they or you know, just to get the living and dead in. Yes, because that I think would be fun too. Yeah, that yeah, they're dead. Yeah, yeah, like they're dead. Like it's gonna be like this is. Are you surprised at how yeah. you are? We'd make them shut up after a while. Right, 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 yeah. Last question: In the event there is someone out there who has yet to see the show, mm -hmm. what's the one thing that makes it unique? Well, <laughs> I think we try very hard to talk about what's happening in the world, we try very hard to be accurate, and then we give ourselves a lot of wiggle room to take whimsical trips down tangent lane. Yep. And the more we do that, the more we sort of have built in this world of our show, right. which certainly makes it more fun for us to do and hopefully also makes it unique for the people who watch it yeah so thank you well said um this has been a great conversation thank you so much both of you for mm -hmm. making the time to be here i want to thank our friends at nbc and to all of our viewers thank you for joining us on half hour with them.